Welcome into another edition of the Hops and Spirits Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Green, and we'll have a very special guest here in just one second. But before we get to that, don't forget to check out our Drinking Buddies Monthly Giveaway Club where we do all sorts of fun things and you can win some great prizes. How do you sign up? It's pretty simple. Go to any of our social media pages, at Hop Spirits, all one word, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Click the link, follow the directions, and within minutes you're signed up to win awesome prizes. We just gave away seven different sample bottles of some cool whiskeys from my bourbon bar. And then, I, you know, who knows what's next. So uh, if you haven't yet, take the time to go sign up. And you can also keep up with all of our fun shenanigans there as well. But it is March, and I guess it's St. Patrick's Day time. I'm not, not familiar with this. Uh, so we decided to bring uh, a, g- a guy that should know plenty about that. He works for uh, Guinness Open Gate Brewery. If you haven't heard of that, they're down in Baltimore. He's their national ambassador. He's a certified Cicerone, Ryan Wagner. Welcome in. Welcome in. Thank you so much, man. Good to see you. Now, um, I, I, before we kind of hit the record button, I, I guess it's St. Patrick's Day, you know, going on this month. Is, is that what I'm hearing here? That's what they tell me. You know, when you work for Guinness, you kind of hibernate until, you know, mid-January, February 1st. And then all of a sudden it's, uh, as I refer to it, it's time for the silly season. Uh, <laughs> lots going on. Um, you know, it's good. I, I was just mentioning to somebody earlier today that there are, you know, I, we have to be thankful at Guinness. You know, it's not often you get to own a day or own a season. Uh, and it's something that's hugely beneficial for us from a heritage point of view and, a, and, and just kind of getting people to fall in love with the brand uh, either again and again in some circumstances or if the first time they get to try a pint of Guinness Draft Stout or one of the beers that we make here in Baltimore is on St. Patrick's Day, uh, you know, we'll take that. Any chance for us to, to share a bit of what we do uh, is a good reason. Oh, a- absolutely. And uh, I'm looking forward to trying a few that, that I'm able to have in front of me here, here today. But before we get into those, and a little bit more about the Open Gate Brewery. I always like to start things off with one tough question. Uh, kind of nice little icebreaker. So for you, I will ask, what is your favorite bar food? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> what am I drinking? You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big, big fan of beer and food pairings. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, what's the seasonality? What's what's the chef's specialty? Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a tough question to answer. I will say that um, I'm going to get, I'm going to, I'm going to get some flack for this, I think, uh, if anybody from Baltimore tunes in. I think I love my city. I'm born and raised here in Baltimore. This is my town. I'm passionately defensive of it. We are in the worst pizza city in America. I, I have yet to find, and I've been very blessed. I've been able to travel around the country. I've been to 49 of the 50 states. I've been to a lot of places internationally. Uh, so I say this with some, some expertise on this. Pizza is really tough. Uh, but what I'll say is there's an incredible place that just opened – uh, here in Baltimore that does Detroit style pizza. So that focaccia like thicker and I've had that more than I'd care to admit the last couple of weeks and um, it reheats really well, which I adore, but also uh, what I've been drinking lately for some reason has been a lot of pale ales, low ABV uh, IPAs. We're, we just debuted an Amber uh, this week. So I've been, I've been crushing on that a little bit too. And I think I'm desperate for warmer weather in the sun and all those kind of things. So those beers have been pairing really well with pizza, uh, especially like that thick, crusty, a little bit of sauce. And instead of a spicy sauce, that richer kind of sweeter tomato sauce. Um, wings are always big for me. What I, what I always forget is that uh, hop compounds and IPAs exacerbate capsaicin. And I'm a wuss <laughs> when it comes to spice. And so I've occasionally made the mistake of like drinking an IPA. And I'm like, oh, yeah, Old Bay Wings. That sounds great. And I'll just annihilate my palate. Um, but yeah, wings are good. And, I, you know, I got into an argument the other day with somebody who asked me what I thought the quintessential American food was. Like if you had one food or one cuisine that you could say was quintessentially American, what would it be? And I think that a lot of people, myself included, my first instinct was to say burgers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that a really good burger when it's made well, we do a great one here at the, the Open Gate Brewery, the OGB. Um, great burgers, I think are an amazing bar food if they're done well and if the fries are here in Baltimore, we have a place that does tater tots, which I think is the great accompaniment for burgers. Yeah. Um, but then also, I think for me, burgers aren't, quinti- aren't the quintessential American cuisine because to me it's barbecue. Because mm-hmm. barbecue is different in every region that you go to. Uh, some are sweeter, some are smokier, dry rubs versus sauces, the way that uh, it's cooked in terms of chopping it up or serving it you know, whole. Um, I, just, I love barbecue because it is as diverse and eclectic as the United States are. And so I think that that, for whatever reason, to me really jumps out. And again, as you travel the country, as I've had the, the great fortune to do, trying the different barbecue in all these places has been a lot of fun. So barbecue to me, I know it's not a traditional bar food, but a nice like pulled pork sandwich, um, 
you know, pulled chicken, brisket, like those kind of things. I'm not a big fan of smoky beers. So if I can get a little bit of smoke from the food and pair that with, again, like an amber ale or something like that, that's that's a good day. Hey, no, nothing wrong with any of those. I, I know for me, sometimes it, it's, it's always nice to have a pizza and a beer. We have a few uh, breweries here in Lexington that you know, have pizza places uh, within them, which is always amazing because it just, I don't know if there's a better combination sometimes than, than pizza and beer when you get down to it. But I, I, I like the barbecue thought process because I was leaning toward burgers and pizza and even wings. Specifically, I like char grilled wings. If you have, haven't had those before, th- those are delicious. Uh, but I think I might, for bar food, if I'm going like a, a meal, probably those char grilled wings, if I'm going an appetizer. I love pulled pork, like nachos or chips of some sort. Uh, I just I feel like you just can't beat that like you know and and heaven forbid they're tater tots you know like pulled pork tater tots I I think I had those out in Portland one time I was like in heaven like that was awesome yeah and I'm a big I I think I'm one of the most American things about me is that I love sauces apparently that's a very American thing that we want 17 dipping sauces and ketchups and mayonnaise and aioli and everything else and if you go to Europe and other places they're like why do you guys dip so many things in so many things <laughs> like it's just that's a very strange thing but I love sauces and barbecue sauces in particular it, it's just there's so much craft involved in that and I guess maybe that's where that connection in my brain is you know you look at beer and the amount of craft and work and experimentation that happens I think you could say the same about barbecue oh yeah I mean food and and beer uh, the artiste uh, gets to come out uh, a little bit when when they're putting those flavor combinations together and I think one of the cool things about what you guys do at, at Open Gate is, you know, people have a very particular image of Guinness. Um, you know, the, the dark stout beer, uh, basically that's for the longest time that was it. That's, you knew what you were getting when you went and grabbed a Guinness or had a Guinness. Uh, but the Open Gate Brewery does things, uh, you guys have a little bit more fun maybe, I could say that. I mean, how, how would you describe uh, the Open Gate Brewery and, and uh, what it is? Yeah, I would say that, uh, you, you know, you're spot on there. Guinness, uh, we're 261 years old, uh, 262 years old, actually. Uh, the, the lease was signed on the brewery in Dublin December 31st, 1759. So, I mean, we've been around a long time. Uh, but I also think that in many ways, Americans uh, tend to be a little myopic in the way that they view the world and the way they view things. And so Guinness, for so many of us here in the States, and I, I, was, I was guilty of this as well, as guilty as anybody, Guinness is a beer, not a brewery, to your point, that we just associated. It's, uh, the example I used earlier was Kleenex. Like, mm-hmm. can you hand me a Kleenex? Like, no, I can hand you a tissue because these aren't Kleenex, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's almost when a, when, a, when a product, there's a term for it as well, and I can't remember what it is, but when a product becomes so synonymous with the, the company making it, where it just it loses its name, essentially. And so I think in some respects, Guinness has long been victims of Guinness Draft Stout's success, if that makes sense. And I I know that's like blasphemous to anybody out there. And I want to be clear, man, I love Guinness Draft Stout. It's one of my Desert Island beers. I think it's the absolute perfect stout. I think it's iconic and unique. And, you know, they say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but no one has ever been able to replicate what Guinness Draft Stout is. And I know a lot of people have tried. Uh, So that being said, The goal of this place when it was built, and we started brewing in September or so of 2017, we had a very small tap room that we opened as the space that I'm sitting in now was under construction. We wanted to give people a chance to kind of see where we were and to watch the construction happening. And we also had our brewing team in place, so we gave them a two-barrel experimental system. Two-barrel, I mean, for those listening that may not know, that's like this big. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's it's basically a a really fancy homebrew system. And we gave them that two barrel so that we could start experimenting and start serving some beer in that tap room. And what was interesting was in that, we called it the test tap room or the TTR. In that TTR, there was kind of an interesting balance of the beers that people either definitely knew from Guinness or were sort of peripherally aware of. So we had Guinness Draft Stout, but then we also had bottles of extra stout. We briefly had a beer called Foreign Extra Stout, which is one of the most iconic beers for Guinness worldwide that most Americans may not even know exists. But that beer we had on draft for the first time in its 200 year life, uh, which was really unique. Um, So we supplemented with those beers, Harp, Smithix, Kilkenny. But we started to roll in some of this experimental stuff to your point. And it was, you know, it runs the gamut. You think about American craft, you think about IPAs, barrel aged beers, um, experimenting with old styles and modernizing them, which is something that we've continued to do. And so I think the TTR for for many of us was kind of the proving ground in a way, Um, but it was also this in immense experiential thing where we could watch in real time 
the light bulb going off as people sort of realized what this place was going to be. Because to your point, I, I remember vividly early on, uh, even when people would walk into this space, which opened in August of 2018, which is grand and it's massive. We have five permanent bars and 82 taps on site and everything. I mean, it's crazy. But when people walked in, they were expecting to see 20 taps of Guinness Draft Stout and 20 taps of Baltimore Blonde. <laughs> and when they walked in on opening day and there were 14 different beers on draft, you could see the moment when people went, whoa, like, what is all this? Um, and I think it's a credit to our brewing team. I think it's a, really a credit to Guinness that they were willing. Uh, <laughs> the line I use all the time is that Guinness knew a very important thing that all great people and all great companies know, which is that they didn't know everything. <laughs> and so they were willing, even as a company that's been around for 260 years, that has produced some of the most iconic beers in the world, that at one time was the largest brewery on earth, they were willing to admit, okay, this is a really diverse and eclectic and interesting and constantly evolving beer market in the United States. If we're going to be a legitimate part of it and an authentic part of it, we need to hire people that understand it intimately. And so to hire a brewing team comprised entirely of American craft brewers uh, whose resumes are some of the best I've ever encountered um, and to give them the keys to this place and say, okay, go teach us what we don't know. Show us what, what you know, we need to know in order to be legitimate, authentic voices within this incredibly diverse craft beer market. Uh, and that's what we focused on over the last couple of years. You know, the line that we always use is we're combining 260 years of Irish brewing experience with American beer creativity. And I think at the crux of it, that's, that's where we live is sort of in that middle point. We're always going to lean on the Guinness pillars of quality and authenticity. Um, but within that, we get to play and to experiment and to use your term, we get to have a little bit more fun than maybe they do in Ireland where uh, the intense uh, focus on that traditional iconic beer and, and the beers that they're producing, there's so much focus on those. And so while they do play outside the margins a little bit, we get to do it even more because the expectation among American drinkers is this, is, is what we're doing here. That's what they're used to now after four decades of craft beer. Yeah. And, and I've been fortunate to, you know, try, haven't been able to get there, but been fortunate enough to try a few of those. I'll never, I'll honestly never forget my very first actual Guinness um, stout. Uh, I was 21, was not prepared for that after drinking, you know, Natty Light and Miller Light my whole life. And, uh, but, but now I have an appreciation for it. Uh, and it's cool to see what you guys are doing because I've got the uh, Galaxy IPA here, um, which I'm not the biggest IPA fan, uh, but, you know, with the, this kind of, with the different hops and everything and the very, it gives you that more tropical fruit flavor. Man, I like this a lot. Yeah, I'm a galaxy fanatic, man. I, uh, I, I am not apologetic about the fact that I'm a galaxy uh, just freak. Uh, galaxy hops are Australian, so it's a New World hop. Uh, gained popularity, I would probably say, over the last three or four years in particular. Uh, because American hops, while they lean very citrus and grapefruit and orange and those types of things, uh, those same hops planted in Australian soil or in New Zealand as well, those citrus flavors become even more tropical. Uh, for me, Galaxy IPA, uh, you're leaning more towards peach rings and uh, mango, passion fruit. Like it gets very tropical fruit forward. The other thing I love about that, uh, that beer is again, the low ABV. You know, I think if you work in enough, uh, if you work around beer enough, you learn to appreciate that more, you know, I, I can certainly appreciate high ABV, the, the intricacies and complexities of barrel aged beers and those sorts of things. But a five and a half percent American IPA, that's a rare thing these days. And so the, the, um, the restraint that our brewers are able to show, the, the measure uh, of, their, uh, of their talent when it comes to producing a beer like Galaxy IPA, that's one that we've brewed a few times. It just keeps getting more and more dialed in. And uh, it's one that when we put it into cans like you have, it flies really quickly. And so it's, it's one that we're proud of. I adore that beer. It's one of my favorites that we make. Yeah, no, like I said, I, I'm not the biggest IPA fan. I think... I'm I'm slowly getting more used to them uh, with bringing folks like yourself on and things like that because everyone does an IPA and and uh, you know I'm more in the sour and and uh, lager realm, uh, which is probably why I do enjoy the the Galaxy with the, that kind of tropical fruity mango citrus style there. But like I said, I mean easy easy drink. Um, one one thing I'm curious about is how did Open Gate get its name? You know, because you guys are in Baltimore, they could have just gone Guinness Baltimore or Guinness. America, America or something yeah. like that, but they yeah. chose Open Gate. Yeah, we why, did. Why is that? Uh, well, the, the, the website is GuinnessBreweryBaltimore.com, so we didn't, we, <laughs> we went directly on the website. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, um, you know, again, it kind of surprises people when they, when they realize this, but 
innovation and creativity and, and pushing the envelope in terms of styles and ingredients and processes and things like that, that's been at the heart of Guinness pretty much since our founding. You know, if you look at some of the scientific developments, I mentioned nitrogenation, um, but really it's across the spectrum of the way beer is produced. That being said, there wasn't an experiential, or ex excuse me, experimental. I use those two words so often in my job that they kind of crisscross in my brain sometimes. There was not an experimental arm focused on nothing but experimental beers and experimental processes at St. James's Gate, our brewery in Dublin, until 1904. And in 1904, there was a unit that was created called the PRU, or Product Research Unit. Uh, and that's where nitrogenation would have been developed. That's where, um, you know, the, the use of stainless steel, cleaning techniques, sanitation tech, like all the things that sort of developed as technology caught up. That's where a lot of that work was being done. And then uh, it wasn't until the 2010s, as a matter of fact, that they threw open the doors of the PRU and allowed people to come inside to see what the experimental folks at Guinness were doing. And so the name of the PRU was officially changed to the Open Gate Brewery because they literally opened the gates for the first time and let people come in. And when it first opened, the Open Gate in Dublin, which is on the same property as, as St. James's Gate, but if you go into the storehouse, which is the g big giant consumer experience building where you take a tour and you go to the roof and you have your beer and the whole deal, you don't actually see the OGB in Dublin. You have to go out, go around the corner and go in. And so it's kind of a hidden gem to some, uh, in some respects. And the goal there was to have a list that was, you know, eight or 10 beers. You would still have Guinness Draft Stout. You would still carry beers like Hop House Lager, which is, you know, one of the, one of the experimental things that has really blown up in Ireland. Um, but the goal was if you, if you bought a ticket, so to speak, to go into the OGB, you would get a flight of four beers. And the only rule was that you had to tell the brewers and the team at the OGB what you thought. You had to give them some feedback. You had to fill out a little form and let them know what you thought. And so when it came time to build this place, I think that the thinking was that this was going to be sort of the, the, the expansion, the natural American branch of what they had already begun more than 100 years ago in Dublin, which was the PRU that eventually became known as the Open Gate Brewery. So our name is a natural transition from the OGB in Dublin, and uh, we, we consider that to be our sister brewery over there. Well, that, that, that's awesome. I, I would love to see some of the feedback that they, they get, because truthfully, that's the best way to get it is directly from someone that's just tried it. And um, obviously, obviously, you can get that from tap sales, things like that and, and so forth. But uh, directly from is all, always better in, in my mind. Uh, another one that I, I decided to, you know, I've kind of cracked them all open just to see what in, what in the world, world we, got we got, is a, is black, a black IPA. IPA. Oh, uh, man. Station at 601. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure, sure I've ever, ever seen, seen <laughs> that dark of an IPA, uh, which hence the name. It's it's a black IPA, but the tangerine comes through very nicely. And I also know the name has some um, uh, history with, with, with the area as well. Yeah, it does. You know, we, um, uh, much like a lot of people, companies, organizations, you know, I, I think one of the, one of the challenges for Guinness and for us here is that for a lot of people kind of, you know, hearkening back to again, Guinness as an idea more so than, than a brewery is uh, Guinness can get a little monolithic. I think in people's minds that it's not people, it's a company that it's not a brewery. It's a beer. You know, they're, they're um, despite what I know about our brewery and, and the people that, that populate it and, and run it um, for a lot of people, I think there's an impersonal kind of quality to Guinness. It's just this one pint of dark beer. And so, uh, we're real people and we are uh, we are as engaged and as as passionate about not just beer and not just our brewery, but about the world that we live in, about the communities that we live and work. Um, and so uh, a lot of us were really impacted by not just what was going on with COVID in 2020, but certainly with the social uprisings that were taking place uh, long overdue in my mind. And so to see Guinness in spite of COVID and in spite of the impact that that had to beer sales and to, to the, the way that we were working to see Guinness stand up and stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter to work on behalf of the people of Baltimore and really across the country, but to identify that we had a responsibility here at this brewery in Baltimore to take care of our backyard, to make a commitment to the city of Baltimore, to the surrounding area here. Um, and so that became a huge focus for us over the course of the last 12 months, uh, you know, nine months, 12 months. And we committed a million dollars uh, to the city of Baltimore, and it was our job to uh, 
uh, figure out a way to use that money to do three things, uh, focus on community empowerment, focus on economic justice, and focus on uh, equal representation. And so we tried to do that in ways that made sense to us and where we had a level of expertise, but also where we could identify partners and friends and organizations. Because when you have a platform like Guinness does during times like these, your job shouldn't be to just use that platform to make your thoughts known. Your job should be to elevate the voices and the people that need to be heard in times like these. Uh, so we're working with a couple of different organizations from the Maryland Food Bank to the Lewis Museum uh, of African American Heritage and Culture, which is right here in Baltimore City. They're a Smithsonian uh, establishment, which is really incredible, the work that they do. Uh, but the beer that you're talking about, Station at 601, I know that was a long way to get back to Station <laughs> at 601, but part of that, uh, part of that community project was the brainchild of Holly. Again, Holly Stevenson, our head brewer. Um, Holly wanted to use our beer and use our brewing to elevate those voices and to elevate BIPOC members of the beer community and uh, really focus attention on making uh, BIPOC communities and minority communities feel like their, not just their faces, but their voices were represented, their communities were represented, their flavors and tastes and their heritage and, and the things that were important to them were represented in the beer that we were making and in the way that that beer was being made. Uh, and so she started this project that we're calling the Allyship Through Collaboration series. Uh, the first one is, I think, another beer that you have, which is See Us. Mm -hmm. uh, the second was uh, Station at 601. And Station at 601 was brewed by Holly with a diverse group of our employees from the, the brewery here in Baltimore. Uh, and the name Station at 601 refers to a train station that stood at 601 South President Street in Baltimore. Uh, the train station is no longer there, but the reason we call out that station is because it was a critical waypoint on the Underground Railroad, uh, bringing slaves north uh, to be freed in the north during the Civil War. Uh, so it's, uh, it is an important thing to call out in terms of Maryland history, in terms of American history, uh, and to uh, point out that we still have a long way to go. Um, and so that beer, the black IPA with tangerines, you know, black IPA is a style that had its moment a little bit five yeah. or 10 years ago. You saw them occasionally, but it's a challenging beer, I think, for a lot of people, because the way that it looks versus the way that it tastes, man, it, it's, it's really unique. But luckily, Holly is a she is an unapologetic black IPA fan. Uh, so we've done a couple of them. And this one, man, it, it blows me away. The, the aroma. Uh, we used to get these things as kids for Christmas. They were chocolate oranges that you would smack on a table and they fall into like orange wedges. I'm doing an awful job of explaining this. But when I held this beer up to my nose, I was transported back to being nine years old as a kid in front of the Christmas tree. Like it was bizarre. Um, and the black IPA, I think, is it's, it, it's such a unique style for us because it's almost like the perfect representation of what Guinness in the United States is. Mm -hmm. It's that dark, roasty, toasty beer that everybody expects from Guinness with a hell of a lot of American hops that is brewed to be an IPA. And so it's this, this really interesting conjunction of those two ideas. Um, and it, it was, uh, it, it's been well received. I think people are trying it sort of like, I'm curious about this, but then once they get that first one, man, the aroma is incredible. There's a bracing bitterness to that beer, which I appreciate. I think that um, I can certainly appreciate the hazy IPA craze and New England IPAs. And, um, but I, I'm kind of an old school guy. You know, I, I like an IPA that's got bitterness because that's what that style is. You know, that's, what, that's, that's what's supposed to be there. Uh, so having a little bit of bitterness in there, I think the tangerine, and it's tangerine puree. It's not an extract or a flavor. That's pure tangerine. And I think that juicy character is really evident, especially on the aroma. Oh, I, absolutely. And I also love just the, the extra meaning behind it because – it's one thing to have a good beer. It's another thing to have a good beer with a good message behind it and something that people can, you know, you can, you can come on here or they're at the bar or wherever and they, they get more, more than what they're expecting uh, out of the flavor, but also, you know, helping out some, some good causes. And I just cracked, I was gonna say, I just cracked open the CS. Yes. So yeah. So CS is the first in that series. This was with, uh, I'll, I'll give a shout out to two of our, two of our dear friends here at the brewery, Jackie Wansey and Courtney Holden. Jackie is at Curly Craft Beer Traveler on Instagram. Uh, Courtney is at black underscore beer underscore geek. Um, and they are two uh, BIPOC influencers in the Baltimore craft community. Uh, Holly befriended them and, and became uh, really close with them. And so when we wanted to kickstart this allyship project, Courtney and Jackie were just the natural, you know, that, that was where we went first. Uh, they were stoked to be a part of it. And what we learned through the process of chatting with them and Holly in, in terms of designing the brew, uh, that both of them had a very close family connection 
to sweet potato pie. And so we made a beer that was a brown ale. We roasted a bunch of sweet potatoes in house and then added, I'm gonna get it wrong. You've got the can in front of you, nutmeg, cinnamon, vanilla, and lactose. And allspice. And allspice, yeah. So yep, yep. what I love about this beer is the baking spices are definitely evident, but mm -hmm. the sweet potatoes give you almost like a rich, complex mouthfeel that's not, at, you know, the, the brown ale kind of pumpernickel bread, nutty character is still there. I think you can still tell that this is a brown ale. It's not overwhelmed in spices or any one flavor, but there is a richness that the potatoes give it that I think is really unique. It's very fun. And this one is called See Us, and I don't think that name needs much explanation at all. No, no, no. and, and it's, it's a really good beer because, you know, sometimes you see all those things on there and you're like, uh oh, this could go really weird. Uh, but no, it, that, that's, that's a really good brown ale. And the spices aren't, like you said, crazy. And, and again, the, 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 that project is just it's really cool to see that you guys are doing that and, and being able to either bring people in to kind of help out and, you know, kind of share their, their story or just kind of going into history and sharing that as well because I, I just love that. Wanna, and I think that, you know, two things. Number one, I should point out that um, – all the proceeds from these, what will be six beers, we released two, the third one is coming out at the end of March. Um, we're gonna do six months in a row releasing one of these beers each month. All the proceeds are being donated to an organization in Baltimore called the Job Opportunities Task Force, or JOTF, which is an organization that takes people in low income jobs and gives them the training and the opportunities to elevate themselves to higher earning jobs. Again, it's, it's that economic justice uh, part of the equation that I mentioned earlier. But number two, man, I'll give a ton of credit here to the work that Weathered Souls Brewing did in San Antonio, because what Weathered Souls did with Black is Beautiful is unbelievable. And the conversation that they started, and I think you could also give some credit to uh, what Sierra Nevada did with resilience in fighting campfire relief uh, all those months ago. It seems like that was 30 years ago um, with all we've been through the last 12 or 15 months. But Weathered Souls Brewing brought attention to the fact that craft breweries are, uh, by and large, they, BIPOC communities are underrepresented um, in tap rooms, in brewing, in hospitality. Like there, there are so many ways that we can elevate those people. You can hire them, you can brew with them, you can, you can find ways to include uh, so many different people in the way that you conduct yourselves from a business point of view or from a beer point of view, whatever it is. Um, but I think without the, the work that Weathered Souls Brewing did with Black is Beautiful, um, I think we would have ended up here at some point, but it made it a much more natural thing uh, to say, yeah, this is a great way for us to use our beer and our brewing uh, to accomplish some of these goals that we've given ourselves. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I love to see that, and I hope others uh, take note and, and follow suit. I know some, some do, some, some are getting, getting more into that, and that, that is awesome to see. Um, you know, you kind of looked at the history, you know, the, the station at 106, it's got a big, big historical ties. That, the location of Open Gate, um, it's got some history too because it, it, it hasn't been a brewery all of, all of its life up until what, like four or five years ago. Before that though, it was a working distillery. It was, yeah. You know, the, the question we get asked more often than any other is why Baltimore? And you don't ask me that question, man, because I'm a Baltimore kid. I'll get fired up about that one. But um, yeah, this site is really cool. You know, it's, um, it's like a lot of Baltimore is. It is beautiful in its industrial kind of rough around the edges quality. Uh, it was born in 1933, right when uh, Prohibition was repealed, and it was uh, commissioned in 1934 as the Maryland Distilling Company. Uh, they were in such a rush to get back into the legal alcohol game, they didn't even come up with a clever name, just Maryland Distilling <laughs> Company. Uh, and then in the early 1950s, it becomes home to Calvert Whiskey, which if you're from this part of the world, Calvert was kind of ubiquitous uh, for my grandparents, for my parents. It's still around, um, but there's definitely local ties there. And then in the early 1960s, Calvert was acquired by Seagram's. And so Seagram's kind of came into the fold. And it was a Seagram's distillery from the 60s all the way until 2003, when Diageo, the company that Guinness founded in 1996, along with Grand Metropolitan, uh, Diageo acquired Seagram's. And so that's how it kind of came into our world. So we were already familiar with the site. But what's really interesting is that this site, in many ways, was uh, kind of put on a back burner, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it. There were new sites being built in Diageo's world. There were places that were being more modernized more quickly. And so this one was uh, a little bit, you know, forgotten about, I guess. Uh, and so when it, we were looking at places to build this brewery, having this site already kind of in our world helped us to really understand what it was gonna take to turn it into what we wanted to turn it into eventually. Um, but also, 
you know, Guinness has long been, I, I jokingly refer to us as the hoarders of, of, the, of the beverage world. You know, we don't, we don't throw stuff away. We, we'll hang on to anything. We see the beauty in a lot of stuff. And so what I appreciate about this, uh, this place, among many things, is that the building that our main space is in, where I'm sitting right now, is a 1940s era rick house that was built at sort of the height of this place being a whiskey distillery. There are still four of those rick houses left on the property. And in this place's heyday, in the site's heyday, you would have been looking at 80 to 90,000 barrels of whiskey each for these buildings. I mean, it was just massive scale production. Uh, we could have knocked this building down and built something that was brand new and sparkling and everything else, but we don't do that at Guinness. We like history. And so we renovated this structure and it's, it's super unique, man. And what I, one of the things that I found really rewarding once we opened the doors, and I've been with the company since, you know, before we broke ground really here, um, we have people almost on a weekly basis because Baltimore is very, we're, we're, a, we're a town of locals, sure. if that makes sense. I mean, we're, we, we, Baltimore, there's a lot of pride that people have when, when you grow up here. Uh, and so we have people all the time that will thank us for maintaining the, you know, and it's, it's not the most beautiful thing in the world, these <laughs> giant brick buildings. I'm not here to tell you that it looks like a, you know, these, these, these weren't done by some famous architect. But there is, for whatever reason, places like I think of Baltimore, I think of Pittsburgh, I think of Cleveland, I think of Detroit, there is beauty in the rough. There is beauty in the industrial. There is beauty in seeing, seeing places where people work with their hands and work uh, and get dirty and go to their favorite bar at the end of the night to have a beer before they go home to have dinner. You know, There's something very blue collar about this location, just like there's something incredibly blue collar about Baltimore. And so we have people all the time that'll thank us for maintaining sort of the aesthetic of this, of this space, but also for even inside the building, maintaining some of like, I, I don't know if you can see behind me, but there's mm -hmm. some giant pillars. What hand yeah. am I using? There it is. There's yeah. some giant pillars. The floor is the same. You can see some brickwork and things that are, you know, just part of the history of this building. And so we've had uh, one of my favorite stories actually about three months after we opened, we had a guy come in with his family and the gentleman was celebrating, I want to say his 95th birthday, 90th, 95th, something like that. He was in a wheelchair, unfortunately, but he had balloons tied to it so everybody <laughs> could see him, which I thought was great. And he had his whole family with him. And the reason they came to celebrate here is because uh, this gentleman had been a distiller here in the 1960s. And he was taking us around. Like yeah, I got yeah. a couple of our brewing team who, were, who happened to be in the tap room at that point, and I brought them over to, to meet this guy. And he took us through the building. Like, oh, this is where this used to be, and this is where I used to do this, and that place is what was this, and you guys are doing this now, but back then we used to do this. And I got to tell you, man, like, that's the stuff we live for here. You know, we, um, would it have been nice to have a brand new, shiny, you know, crazy, all the bells and whistles building? Yeah, I mean, it would have been fun, but there's something about this place that makes it more a part of Baltimore and more a part of the history and the heritage um, and the word that I use all the time, it's more authentic because we renovated this space. Well, yeah, and, and that history gets to live on, and and uh, you guys now get to kind of bring it back to life and make it a, a another site that's producing some some quality uh, drinks. It's a little different than uh, you know the, the whiskey that they were producing, but uh, still some pretty good stuff. Uh, the last one I've got because I don't want to forget it is the blueberry stout, and. Uh, it's a nice, it's, it's just a nice, I, I love all the fruit that you guys use. Or, you know, you guys, it just, I, that's right up my alley. I just love it all. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that, number one, um, what I love about that blueberry stout is that if, some, if, if it didn't say it on the can and no one told you, you might not be able to pick it out as blueberry. It's very yeah, subdued. Yeah. It's very light. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of a, um, just kind of a light tartness on the back end of the palate because, again, it's, it's fresh blueberry puree. And I think that that's something that, um, our brewers have been particularly adamant about. Uh, there are lots of extracts out there and flavorings and things like that that will do the job for you. But there's something to be said about fruit puree. There's something to be said about that fresh kind of quality to it um, and using the whole fruit in some circumstances. Uh, we're introducing a, a salt and lime ale uh, here in a couple weeks mm -hmm. that's going to use whole key lime puree and hand harvested sea salt from the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. So we're going to try to use those ingredients whenever we can. But the blueberry stout is like... It's one of, those, one of those stories where people want there to be some epic moment where this idea came about. Uh, and sometimes it's just as simple as, hey, we got a tank of milk stout down there. We got some blueberry puree. 
I wonder what that would do. You know, it's, it's kind of <laughs> like, and so we, we introduced it and we, you know, we have the ability to do a lot of fun, like one-off stuff, you know, where we try it and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I will say that uh, what I'm incredibly proud of and what I talk about all the time is we don't dump beer. You know, there may be a beer that wasn't exactly what the brewers thought it was going to be, wasn't, uh, you know, doesn't suit everybody's palate, but every beer we make is going to be high quality. It's going to be drinkable. It's going to be, um, it's going to be balanced. And this blueberry stout, I think, is a perfect example of that. It was incredibly exper uh, experimental when we started it, when we, when we came up with the first batch, but then it sold so freaking well <laughs> that we had to brew it again. And then it sold really well again, so we brought it back and put it into cans. Um, and this was one that, you know, when you talk to the brewers, there's kind of a chuckle, like, no, oh, sure, glad it's working. You know, glad, you know sometimes you just kind of, you, 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 uh, I don't want to say luck into one because that, that disparages the incredible amount of work and expertise that these guys have. But sometimes you just have one where it surprises you how well it takes off and how well it does. Um, and this is, again, you know, when we talk about, I think there, there, there are three groups of people, and this is very general, you know, generalizing in a, in a big way. But when we talk about the people that come through here, I look at three different groups specifically. One is the Guinness adorer. The people that are going to come in here and regardless of what we got on the menu, they're getting their pint of Guinness draft stout and also how dare you, right? I mean, that's been, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, we love those people. They're, they are, they are as, as passionate as anybody gets when it comes to Guinness and that's okay. We're going to serve them a perfect pint of Guinness draft. Mm -hmm. We work long and hard at making sure that we are serving every bit as good a pint as they get in Dublin. Number two are the Guinness fans who are curious and eventually kind of convert over into, I'm gonna show up. I might end my night or start my night with a pint of Guinness Draft, but I'm also gonna try all the new stuff that you guys have. And then the third group to me are the group that, you know, are everyone else. They may not even be beer fans. They may have been dragged here by a husband or a wife or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a brother or sister, whatever it is. And they're the ones that walk in and go, can I just have a vodka soda? Like, they're like, I don't drink <laughs> beer. But our job is to make sure that regardless of your experience when it comes to beer, your palate, your, uh, your knowledge of or lack thereof of Guinness and what you expect this to be, we always wanted this to be a brewery for everybody. So if you're passionate about beer, history, Guinness history, Irish culture, the heritage of this site and Baltimore history, whatever it is, we wanted to make sure that there was something here for you to take away. Um, and Blueberry Stout, I think, is one of those beers that we rely on a, to a great deal because it's one of those beers that, like, how do I want to describe this? It's like a, it's like a gateway into stout. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, what, people come here and they're like, I don't really like Guinness. I don't like stout. I don't like the big, heavy, dark and all that stuff. And we know that Guinness Draft Stout isn't heavy. It's not, you know, it's not any of the things that people perceive it to be. But when they see Blueberry Stout, they go, well, I'll try that one. Yeah. And so it's, it's become a really interesting way to see people uh, expand their understanding of what stout can be. And, and I, I feel like you, you set this up, like you knew exactly what I was going to ask next, because I, you mentioned, you know, not everyone that comes to a brewery uh, may be a beer fan. They may be dragged along or maybe they're just meeting up with some friends because, you know, that's where they wanted to go. Uh, what, what can people expect when they go to Open Gate? Boy, this would have been a different answer 12 months well, yeah. ago. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what can you expect? I, I think that you can expect, number one, uh, the most knowledgeable staff you're going to come across in a craft brewery. That's something that I'm incredibly passionate about. I demand a, uh, I demand a, a pretty high bar from, from our men and women, uh, and they deliver over and over again. They surprise me with how much they know sometimes. Um, so you're going you're gonna to find a passionate and educated group of people that are taking care of you. Uh, number two, you are going to really understand what the term Irish hospitality means because at our heart, you know, at our, at our core, we're still an Irish entity. We're still, we, you know, we have a 40 foot harp on the front of our building. Uh, so Guinness and Ireland are still very much at the heart of all we do. And Irish hospitality is world renowned. That sense of, uh, I think our, you know, our, we have a marketing manager named Oliver who uses a phrase that I adore, uh, that when you're here, there are no strangers, just friends you haven't met yet. Uh, it's marketing speak, but I love it. So Kudos to Oliver for that one. Um, so that sense of Irish hospitality, you know, we, we understand how important it is. Um, and we talk about this idea of the perfect pint because that's so synonymous with Guinness draft. But for us, the perfect pint starts when you arrive and ends when you get home safely. Uh, so from every single interaction and experience you have while you're at the brewery, whether it's, you know, using bathrooms and they're 
you know, spotlessly clean. Uh, it's going into the retail shop and talking with somebody who knows everything about pricing and sizes and everything else, talking to the bartenders and getting the perfect recommendation for a beer. Um, and then having a staff and having a group of people that know enough about our products and know enough about our policies that they're gonna, they're gonna serve you responsibly so that you're able to make it home. Uh, and, and you're gonna practice responsibility. So there, there, I think that sense of Irish hospitality is sort of at the core of everything we do. Uh, number three, you're gonna see a crazy expansive beer list that you're not expecting. Um, you know, everything from a, if you come in this week, for instance, you'll see an 11.9% barrel aged mint chocolate stout, uh, an amber ale brewed with Irish breakfast tea, which is what I've got right here. I absolutely <laughs> love this beer. It just came out, or it's coming out this week. Um, and you're going to see those Irish favorites, but you're going to see literally everything in between. Um, and you are, there are going to be no expectations. And I think that that's something that occasionally uh, American beer market, the American beer market can kind of get away from a little bit where there is an expectation that you need to know something or you need to be overly uh, educated when it comes to beer. There's no expectations here. You know, we're, we're going to give you an experience regardless of, again, your beer expertise, your passion for Guinness, your knowledge of, of beer in general. You know, it, we wanted this to be uh, just a great place to have a beer. You know, this we you know, prior to COVID, we had tours and there's certainly the elements of that that we're excited to bring back whenever we're, we're safely able to do that. Um, but while those tours and tastings and things like that, they'll always be a part of what we do. What I love about this place is that if you just want to come in after a rough day of work and have a beer, you can do that. Uh, we get calls and, and, and messages all the time from people who say like, how much is a ticket? I'm like, you don't need one. Just stop by and have a beer, man. Let us talk to you for a little while. Uh, the best tour you might get is sitting at the bar, talking to one of the bartenders. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple of things that I think are always going to be at the core for us. Hospitality, knowledgeable and passionate staff, great beer list. And then uh, just sort of an experience for everybody, regardless of what you're looking to do. Uh, that, that is awesome. And I can't wait to hopefully get down there uh, one of these days and, and visit. And, and hopefully we'll get back to a little bit more of a normal uh, nor normal world where, where you can do those tours. and have, From, uh, from uh, your lips to God's ears, man. We're, we're <laughs> chomping at the bit. You know, I, I got to give a, a quick shout out. Our tour guides are some of the most knowledgeable people here, as you might expect. I mean, these... We hire these guys based on their passion and their drive and their energy and everything else. Um, and in, th in these times, unfortunately, when tours have had to be put on pause, they've become the single most knowledgeable group of hosts and hostesses <laughs> that I've ever seen. Like the experience that you get walking from our front gates to your table, you're going to get a five minute dissertation on everything that Guinness is about. And it's amazing to watch. Uh, and just like the rest of the world, man, we've, we've switched to a lot of digital programming. So like even people in your part of the world in Kentucky, uh, we have a, a virtual tasting that people can find on the website where you can find all four of the beers that are part of that virtual tasting at most liquor stores around the country. So you go and buy those four beers, pay us a couple bucks for the Zoom code, and then you get a Zoom hour long on virtual, on Zoom tasting, guided tasting with one of our tour guides to take you through the entire history of Guinness and four beers. And uh, that kind of thing seeing the, th that same passion and that same energy they applied to tours being applied to this new format that we're just kind of stumbling our way through in many ways has been, uh, they, they inspire me to go to work every day. Our whole staff here, man, the work that they've done since COVID hit and, and cha, I mean, good gracious, the amount of curveballs we've thrown at them and expectations that we've given them and um, to have a space this large uh, to still do the volume of, of people that we do and to do it as safely and with as much uh, dedication and respect and willingness to adjust. Um, I, yeah, I mean, they, they get me fired up to come to work every day because of, of how hard they work and how much they care about this place. Uh, that, that, that's awesome to hear and that's awesome to see. And it's cool that you're, you're allowing folks that maybe can't get there to, to have a chance to experience the, the, the Guinness way, the Guinness, uh, you know, that, that's awesome. And, and uh, you know, like I said, th these beers have kind of opened my eyes uh, to, to the Guinness and what, what, what y'all can, can do. I mean, for those that don't know, the, the Baltimore Blonde is obviously made now there. Um, and that's kind of one of the first ones I had from y'all outside of the regular Guinness. And uh, the, these ones are a step up from that in terms of just, you know, the Blonde is a Blonde. I was going to say, don't, 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 don't go disparaging gonna, Baltimore <laughs> Blonde now. Every one of those that gets sold is one more day I get to keep my job. So, no, Baltimore Blonde, man, that, it's, 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 uh, I appreciate you saying what you said because I do think that, you know, the level of experimentation and ingredients and everything else, 
Blonde is the number one selling beer at our brewery every week. We sell more Baltimore Blonde here than we sell Guinness Draft Stout, believe it or not, which is crazy. Um, but that beer just has such a broad appeal. And if you're in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia, Pennsylvania, like this sort of geographic area, um, that's become a really like it's it's everybody's kind of go to. And I, I love seeing that because. You know, the idea of us creating a beer that looks like that, that tastes like that, this light, crisp, hoppy, kind of citrusy blonde ale, that is, in many ways, that is the complete opposite end of the spectrum from Guinness Draft Stout. So to see how people have embraced it, to see how it's become, you know, just kind of a go-to beer for people in this part of the world and really across the country, uh, it's been fun. That's, I, I love blonde, so I just, I'm bad mouth and blonde I, on here. I, 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 I that one because <laughs> to me, like, see, I'm, I'm the guy that, I'm I'm either in group I'm in group number two of those three that you talked about because I'm not coming there just for the Guinness. I appreciate it. It's just not my thing. Um, but the the blonde is what would have probably got me in there. Um, and then having all these other ones uh, would would have gotten me to stay and, and keep coming back because, uh, like I said, you guys are doing some really cool things. Uh, the, the the IPAs I had. I'm not a big IPA fan, but the black IPA, the the station at, at six hundred one, the get and the Galaxy IPA were both wonderful. Um, you know, the blueberry stout, like you said, you don't get a ton of blueberry, but that's not a bad thing. Um, it's kind of like a subtle thing. Um, the see us brown ale, um, for, for what all's in that, not, not crazy on overwhelming the senses. It's just a, a hell of a mix. And, um, I, I am very impressed. And, uh, uh like I said, I, I truly can't wait to come visit. Yeah, it's a great place, man. I mean, this, this place is the life force of it is, is the people who occupy it you know, the people that spend time here. And, you know, I was here when we shut down last year, it was October, October, listen to me. It was March 13th, um, the Friday before St. Patrick's Day. And what I remember most vividly about it was uh, the next week we came in, I came in to kind of shut down the draft system because we anticipated that it was gonna be a relatively extended layoff. I, I, you know, kind of saw the writing on the wall, but I remember walking into this place and for the first time in a long time, uh, I was here when there, nobody else was. Mm -hmm. And you, you see this incredible space and all the work and all the passion and dedication that people have put into uh, bringing it to life. And really, uh, meaning, meaning, you know, I, I mean it when I say breathing life into this place. Uh, and I remember how I felt in that moment. And then I also remember how I felt a few months later when we decided to reopen the outdoor space, when we had figured out our protocols and we were given permission by the you know, state of Maryland. Uh, how I felt when we brought staff back in for that first retraining to get us going again uh, and seeing this place come to life again. Um, we are only as, as experiential and amazing and, and impactful as the people that come here. So, yeah, man, I look forward to hosting you when you make it up. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, I, I'm, I'm this close to it and I'm very <laughs> fired up about this place. So, you know, I, I, uh, I'm very biased, but I love this place. No, that, that is awesome to hear. And uh, like I said, I, I really appreciate you talking about the Open Gate Brewery, Guinness in Baltimore, and, and hopefully more people will, will check it out. And, and Ryan, I really appreciate, appreciate your time. time. Can, I, can I give you one Lexington story? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, have a Le I, have a Lex I have a Lexington story. So I was uh, very fortunate in a former career. I was a stage actor. Ooh. And I did a Broadway national tour for a couple of years. And we played the Lexington Opera House. Mm -hmm. It was the only time I've been to Lexington. Absolutely loved it. Had a great time down there. Uh, saw a drag show, actually, one of, one of the nights after the show at a bar not too far away from the Opera House. I don't, couldn't tell you what the name of the bar was. But what I remember, I was doing the Wizard of Oz. You may have heard it. Heard uh, of the Wizard of Oz. So. Uh, and in each town that we traveled to, we got a new set of kids from a, usually a local theater group or dance group or whatever it was that were our munchkins, that were part of our munchkin group. And... It was always a, when we were getting ready to leave the show, the actors at the end of a show, we would walk out through our stage door or lobby or whatever it was, and there were always parents that were waiting to pick up their kids. And Lexington, I walked out and I was nodding to the parents, your kid did great, your kid did great. I didn't know their kid, your kid did great, whatever. And I, your kid did great to a guy, and I was like, I know that guy. Who is that guy? It was Steve Zahn. For anybody that knows, he's an actor. He was in That Thing You Do, and he was in a bunch of other Joyride and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and it was just so bizarre because he's not like an A-list celebrity, but I was like, you're Steve Zahn. He's like, yeah, hi, how are you? My daughter was one of the, it's, hi, you know. And I was like, oh, yeah, no worries, man. Just wanted to say hi. I thought it was cool. You know, I appreciate your work. Great job. And then three months later, we were in New Orleans, walking down the street, just randomly, getting lunch before a show, coming the other direction, 
in New Orleans, Steve's on. <laughs> out of nowhere. I've never seen one celebrity twice in my life except this guy. And in the middle of New Orleans, by himself, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I stopped in the middle of a street, turned around, and I was like, that's Steve Zahn again. He turned around and looked at me terrified. And I was like, we're with the Wizard of Oz. We saw you in Lexington. And he was like, okay. And I was like, I don't, re- this is weird, isn't it? And he was like, I'm going to keep going. I'm getting out. Yeah. He was there filming uh, Treme, the HBO show. But it was just, that's my Lexington. Every time I hear about Lexington, I'm like, that's where Steve Zahn was. So I don't know if he lives there, but that's yeah, the he, most, that's the he, most bizarre story I've got about Lexington, Kentucky. Hey, nothing wrong with that. He's from here. Uh, he does, does a lot of voiceover work, uh, some of the studios around here. So it, what, what's weird about Lexington though, is you never know what celebrity might just be hanging out somewhere unbeknownst to you because they came in to do the horses or, you know, bourbon or something. Uh, my, my wife and her sister were at the liquor store and they're like, man, I know that voice. It was uh, a K- Haley uh, Cuoco from the Big Bang, Bang Theory. Kaylee Cuoco. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they were like, I mean, they're in the liquor barn or liquor world or whatever. And she's then, big into horses, right? Isn't she a that, big horse person? Yeah. And that's why, that's why. She, was she was up here up. doing her horse. You know, riding horses, I think, at the horse park or, or whatever. But she just, you know, hey, everyone needs to go to the liquor store, I guess. And <laughs> she just happened to be there. So, well, I never uh, I never felt more like a city kid than when we went to Lexington. And we were walking around the first day we got here. And I was like, what are all these things lying in the street? Like, what are these little stat? Like, what, are, what the hell are those? Stop somebody local. And they were like, that's where people hitch their horses. And I was like, oh, because there's like all the little. And I think they're more decorative than anything yeah. else. But there's all like the horse hitching posts. Yeah. Yeah, no. Hey, w- w- if you get to come back, we'll 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 have a drink and maybe uh, go go watch some horses uh, run around. Uh, uh, Ryan, I-, I appreciate it. This was a blast, and I can't wait to do it again. Yeah. Hey, no worries, man. I'm glad I was able to get some beer to you. Uh, if anybody listening wants to check us out or those virtual tastings, as I said earlier, it's GuinnessBreweryBaltimore.com. That answers a bunch of questions. Um, and then feel free to reach out to me. I'm R Wags R W A G S six one four on Instagram. Uh, feel free to throw me a message or anything like that if anyone has any questions. But I appreciate you having us on, man. Pray for, pray for, pray for the team here as we get through March 17th. <laughs> uh, wait, something's going on? Just, just kidding. I definitely will. Pre- I appreciate it, Ryan. No worries. Thanks, man. Uh, if you couldn't tell, that was a lot of fun. I appreciate uh, Ryan hopping on the podcast to talk about the Guinness Open Gate Brewery down there in Baltimore. Uh, some really amazing beers that they're putting out there. Um, most people have only heard of you know the typical Guinness that you get or maybe the Baltimore Blonde, but they're doing some really good things, uh, making some really good beers down there at Open Gate. So if you're in that area uh, or thinking about making a trip, I highly recommend it. Um, you know, I can't believe St. Patrick's Day is coming up. It's a time of celebration. I also want to celebrate and say happy birthday to the first lady of the podcast uh, as she celebrated a birthday recently. So happy birthday. Uh, for those that are also looking to celebrate, our Drinking Buddies uh, Club has another monthly giveaway, and it's a good one. Got a little bit of everything. Uh, what, what's up for grabs? How about this? Two Traverse City Whiskey Company t-shirts, a Traverse City Whiskey Company snapback hat, a camp mug as well from Traverse City Whiskey Company. Uh, for the beer lovers, a West Six Brewing Dad hat and some Goodwood Brewing stickers. And here's where things get fun. Whoever wins gets their choice of either this, a 50 milliliter sample of Wheel Horse Bourbon Batch 1, and a 50 milliliter sample of Middle West McLone Reserve Bourbon. Or uh, you get Urban Artifacts Pinwheel Orange Gosa, the Guinness Open Gate CS that we just talked about, and Braxton Brewing Garage Beer. Your choice of either the whiskey or the beer, depending on maybe what's your preference. Uh, so uh, how do you get signed up for that if you're not? Well, just go to any of our social media pages, at Hop Spirits, all one word, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, at Hop Spirits, all one word. Click the link in our bio. Follow the directions. takes just about a minute. Um, and then you're signed up, not just for this giveaway, but for all of our giveaways after that. Like last month, we just gave away seven different whiskey samples. Uh, the month before that, five different beers out of the beer fridge. So you never know what you're going to win. going to try to do a good job of being a nice little balance or giving you a chance to win either whiskey or beer, since I know we have a lot of uh, listeners that, that enjoy both or maybe just one or the other. Also, don't forget to check out our social media pages and uh, watch our Give It A Try 60-Second Highlights, where we highlight a different 
bourbon, whiskey, uh, maybe cocktail mixer, or even beer every Sunday night at 8 on our social media pages and our YouTube page. That's our Give It A Try 60-second highlight. You don't want to miss that. Last week, uh, last Sunday, was the Barrel Armedia. And we also have had the Proof Old Fashioned Cocktail Mixers and a few others as well. Those are every Sunday night at 8 Eastern on our social media pages. Don't forget to check out our Partners in Crime One Sip Beer Review. They're on Instagram with their daily beer reviews, giveaways, and a whole lot of fun. And remember, if you can, give it a try. And until next time, cheers, everyone. <laughs>